This uh, first spot of speakers for, for the second day of our conference is brought to you by Vision, the nation's spiritual station, and by one, the Body, Mind, and Spirit channel. These are television operations with which we will be soon very closely aligned. Um, their orientation is to matters spiritual, and that's why they are sponsoring this next group of speakers who are going to address questions of ethics. We'll begin with Ms. Somerville. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to have this opportunity. I must admit, I've been sitting there thinking about, well, what's the relationship between ethics and magic and ethics and practicing for war? And um, I guess that some people sometimes think that uh, the basis on which we do ethics is a bit flaky, so I suppose that's got some relationship to magic and perhaps illusionary in some circumstances. And the war analogy is really fairly apropos because very often as an ethicist, you, are, you do feel you're engaged in battle because what ethicists do is... First, well, they, they're really advisors. I mean, we're sometimes called the moral police. Um, but uh, we try to, first of all, help people not to do harm or not to do wrong. And then we try to help people to do right or to benefit uh, either other people or society. And we do it in that order. Not everybody agrees about that, that not doing harm is more important than doing good. I happen to be one of the people who think that that's true. So, as you heard, this session is devoted to spirituality, and when I first heard that, I thought, well, what on earth am I going to say about spirituality? Because I'm not a theologian, I'm not a member of the clergy. And the more I thought about it, the more that I decided spirituality has got a lot to do with ethics. And so this is the little statement that I, I made about that, that spirituality is to ethics as oxygen is to breathing. You can breathe all you like, but if you're not breathing in oxygen, you're not doing very well. In other words, oxygen is essential. And I, so I concluded that I think spirituality is essential to ethics, and I know there's going to be outrage among my atheist friends about this because what they think I'm saying is that you cannot be good without God. And I'm not saying that at all, uh, what, because it depends on how you define spirituality. And I define a spiritual experience or spirituality as first of all amazement, then awe, then wonder, and sometimes immense joy at what you have experienced. And it's, it's a, a feeling of what we call in ethics transcendence. That is that you, you belong to something larger than yourself, that there is something larger than yourself that's very important and that you are part of it. And sometimes that leads to transformation. And I believe that that's a very important experience. Uh, and the reason is this, that we get very nervous as humans when we feel that we don't have mastery and control. And one of the big sources of mistakes in ethics is when we, f when we refuse to recognize that we're uncertain about what to do and we refuse to recognize the complexity of the situations that we're faced with. And what we do is we turn it into false certainty and we're certain but we're wrong. Or we turn complexity into simplistic responses and again, they seem okay but they're they're wrong. So it's very important to try to live as comfortably as we can with necessary unavoidable uncertainty and complexity. And that's actually the first lesson that I teach my students. I teach in both the Faculty of Law and the Faculty of Medicine at McGill. So I'm dealing with people who are going to have a lot of future uncertainties and complexities and they have to learn to be uh, comfortable with those. Now the second thing I want to talk to you about is, and 
and this is, this is hypothetical and it's rather radical and I've had lots of flack for saying this, but I am interested in whether our experience of spirituality as I define it might have a genetic base. Now, why might I think that? Well, the reason is that most people seek these experiences of awe, wonder, amazement, and also the search for morality is universal and it's existed ever since, we, uh, certainly for known human history. Now, when you see something that goes across all kinds of societies and cultures and is common to all sorts of people, no matter where they come from, what they believe, there is, you can sort of think, well, maybe there's a genetic base to that, that we actually inherit, inherit that tendency to need that. Now, very very quickly, I want to say to you, I'm not a genetic reductionist. I have furious fights with Richard Dawkins. He once told me that um, I was full of mystical nonsense. And uh, I told him he was mystically tone deaf. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, so that's, that's not what I'm saying. We're not just gene machines or genes are us. But, what, but what I would, how I would get you to try to think about this is we're all sitting here. We're not listening to a radio program or a television program, but we know because we've seen them that if we had a radio or a television, we could receive those programs. But those, that radio and television don't determine what the program is. They're just the necessary receptors for the program that we, we want to hear or watch. And that's how I see the genes. Further, um, there's a whole new absolutely miraculous field of genetics called epigenetics. And we, now know, and we now know that some of our genes, certainly if we're like rats, which we are in, in some respects, uh, code for behaviours. And we also now know through epigenetics that there has to be an environmental trigger at a certain critical point that the baby, for instance, a baby rat is exposed to, to activate that gene. We call it imprinting. Moreover, we know that that gene changes its composition. It actually physically changes as a result of that imprinting. These, this research was done on uh, nurturing genes in rats. Unless the mother rat licks the baby shortly after birth, that gene shuts down for life and that little rat, when it grows up, can't nurture its own young. What I've been thinking about, I've got no proof of this, is that maybe we've, if we've got genes for spirituality and maybe they need to be activated by some early experiences. If that's true, then we might want to think differently about what we expose our children to. So that's just what I want to say about that. Now, I think that this capacity for, for uh, our spirituality, I call it the human spirit. And what I'm trying to do, and I've done in one of the books that I wrote called The Ethical Imagination, is to find a baseline that we all feel we can participate in, that will enable us to start to try to find some shared ethics. So we don't want to exclude people from the beginning. We want to have people who are non-believers, who are atheists, agnostics. We want to have people who are religious. And if they're religious, no matter which religion they belong to. And so this is how I describe the human spirit, this intangible, ineffable reality. All of us need to have access to find meaning. I think that will prove to be the unique characteristic of humans, this need that we have to find meaning. And that's what ethics is meant to help us to do, to make life worth living. It's a deeply intuitive sense of relatedness or connectedness to all life. I happen to believe unless we have a better respect for all life, we won't be able to maintain respect for human life, and especially other people, the world, and the universe in which we live. In other words, this is this sense of amazement, wonder, awe, and one would hope as a result some joy. So the questions, one of the uh, issues that I, I thought about it yesterday when we were all doing those yoga exercises, you know, the ones that the, the teacher was teaching us, um, at the end of yoga, you put the, your hands come to prayer position and usually uh, the teacher, depending on who it is, will say namaste. I decided to look into what, what that meant and... Uh, 
I'm told by uh, Professor Arvind Sharma, one of my colleagues, a very distinguished Hindu scholar, that the best translation from the Sanskrit is that the light in me recognizes the light in you. And so that's a mutual recognition, as I'd see it, of our human spirit that we all share, but yet we also have individually, and that we recognize it in each other. So now, if this is so important, this human spirit, we have to think about how can we protect it? Because I think it is, it's under threat at the moment. It's particularly under threat in some ways from the new science, because we hold the essence of life itself in the palm of our collective human hand. We can do things to life, all life and also human life, that no other humans before us have ever been able to even contemplate. And that's because of our new molecular biology and genetics and what we can use to do those. We can design our children, for example. We can make it, we will be able probably to make a baby from two men or from two women. All sorts of things that we have to think about, should we ever do that? And what I've suggested, and again, uh, this caused battles, is that we need not only a religious sacred, which is what we've used in past societies to protect the things that are most important to us, but we need a secular sacred as well. Because what a sacred means is that we will protect that. Now, when I suggested this concept of the secular sacred, which I suggested originally in a book I wrote in 2000, everybody went ballistic. The religious people hated it. They said, this is denigrating the sacred. And the uh, non-religious people hated it because they said, you're trying to impose religion on us. Now, I wasn't trying to do either of those things. What I was trying to do was to find a base where we could ex have an experience of sharing a common morality, that we would all agree that this is, should be done or should not be done. I mean, one good example of it is our out outrage about torture. Whether or not we're religious, whatever we are, most of us, the vast majority of us, think torture is wrong. And I think that's an example of the sort of thing that we can find. So what I, what I want to talk about now is how does the, these concepts that I've suggested to you help us to govern this extraordinary new science? The Japanese have a saying which I think is wonderful. It says, as the radius of knowledge expands, the circumference of ignorance increases. So if you imagine our knowledge being like a laser beam that goes out into the darkness of our unknowing, the further out it goes, the bigger the circle of what we don't understand. We now know that there is, we know so much more that we know that we know hardly anything. And it's extremely important to understand that. Now, depending on how you react to that, you will join one of two opposing camps. Uh, the pure scientists, who are very, uh, many of whom, I mean, Richard Dawkins is a good example of this, but there's a whole lot of them. Uh, uh, Christopher Hitchens, Michel Onfray in Paris, etc. What they think is that science is the only valid way of knowing and that eventually we will be able to know everything through science. What people like me think, and I'm science, human spirit, is that science is miraculous and marvelous and it opens up this awe, wonder and amazement that all life on Earth comes from these four nu nucleotides. I mean, it's an absolutely amazing thing that all humans, except for identical twins, have a unique genetics and yet there's only these four basic units that form each of us, that form our DNA. And so I believe that there's a lot we can know through science, but that we also have to keep in mind that there's other human ways of knowing, and that for some people it's religion, for some people I think it can be just the human spirit, which doesn't say that you have to believe in anything supernatural, but it does say that you have to believe that there is simply, that there is more than science, which represents reason, logic, mentation, 
that can tell us things that we know through what I call other ways of human knowing, imagination and creativity, human memory, which is John Ralston Saul's term for history, um, all of these intuition, especially moral intuition. And I've been going on about this for about nine years now. And, and one, of my, one of my colleagues said to me, you know, you ought to be t careful, Margot. You're dangerously on the edge of total BS. And I, when, I put it in my, when I put it in my book, I put it as dangerously on the edge of total flake. It sounded a little bit more respectable. But now what has happened, there's been recent articles in Nature magazine, which is one of the major science magazines of the world. There's an article called The Moral Brain. And what they were able to show scientifically was that people with damage to the emotional centers of their brains could not make good good ethical decisions. And people with uh, m malfunction in the frontal cortex, this part of the brain that does judgment, uh, made, and I love this because usually I'm fighting with utilitarians, made overly utilitarian decisions so that these decisions were not ethical. So part of what I want to talk a tiny bit about here is stars that scientists tell us, uh, for instance, Paul Davies, the astrophysicist, uh, that possibly life on Earth, they think it started 4.8 billion years ago, and may have come from tiny organisms in meteorites, possibly that came from Mars, and that were able to withstand great pressures and heat as they came through the shield around the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, these extreme organisms we're finding at the mouths of undersea volcanoes may be the living descendants of those organisms. If so, that means that all of us here are the wondrous outcome of this immense period of time, 4.8 billion years, and stardust and that now we can change that. So the question is, should we do so? That we can actually take over human evolution. We can redesign an embryo. It won't be like us, just a natural human. It will be a, an embryo designed by some of us. And that, em that embryo though, will pass on all those changes to all of its descendants. So the big question is, should we do that? Um, I once saw a Charlie Brown cartoon, and it shows Linus and Charlie sitting, gazing out at the, uh, the night sky. And uh, Linus says to Charlie, you know, Charlie, Carl Sagan says that we can see billions of stars there, and there's billions and billions more that we can't even see. And there's a pause, and Charlie says, forlornly, I miss my dog. And I thought a lot about that cartoon, as you know, a lot of those Peanuts cartoons make you think. And I decided that what that was really saying was that we as humans need to have one hand in the earth or patting an animal, in other words, to be grounded. And we also need to have another hand reaching out to the stars in other words, our creativity and imagination, and that we need both, and they have to be in balance. And that if we're going to hope to make wise decisions and act wisely, then that's what we need. And we, have, we can't just assume that will happen. We have to work to make sure that that happens. So finally, um, this is my final, how can we do that? How can we make sure that we hold on trust for future generations what we've been given, that we can hold it on trust in a way that doesn't do them and the world they will inherit irreparable harm? And I think the answer to that is that we must always have hope and we have to avoid cynicism and nihilism. And a journalist once asked me what was the favorite sentence I'd ever written. And I said without hesitation, and this links to the first statement I made, hope is the oxygen of the human spirit. Without it, our human spirit dies. With it, we can overcome even seemingly insurmountable ob objects or obstacles. And um, 
hope is a sense of connection to the future. So we have to generate in ourselves and generate in others that we have this enormous, not just this enormously valuable physical world, which we're now worried about holding on trust, worrying about the BP oil spill, but we also have what's called a metaphysical world, a world of values, attitudes, beliefs, stories that we share with each other. And we also have to hold that on trust for future generations. And that's the role of ethics, to help us to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a graduate of McGill, by the way. Um, if, if we weren't already so scandalously behind time, I would have loved to follow up with you. You made the observation that we face the likelihood, not the possibility, of children born of female couples or male couples and all kinds of new combinations become possible in the future. Uh, I would have loved to have heard your, your view whether that's a good thing or not. Well, the short answer that I would give is no. I think, in fact, I think the most fundamental human right of all, and I've just been lecturing on this in Europe, is a child's right to come from natural human origins. And that's what I'm hoping we will one day recognize as a fundamental human right. Well, thank you for that. You are staying with us over the next yeah. day? Yeah. Yes, well then I'll seek you out personally. Okay. We'll continue the conversation. Uh, yes, how about that, Foga? <laughs> Thank you.